If you would, share with the audience um, what the value is to Brown Foreman, um, what the bourbon industry is in value in terms of revenue, investments, and so forth. Look, can I just say thank you uh, to start. Thank you for having me. Certainly. Uh, it's, a, it's a treat, and thank you, Kentucky Chamber, uh, for thinking of Brown Foreman and for inviting me along today. Um, it's a, it's, I saw, I got to see um, uh, Rusty Justice mm. uh, speak this morning, and I don't know if he's still here, but I just found it inspiring uh, and funny. I felt some pressure after that. <laughs> um, and, uh, but it, was, uh, it just reminded me um, of, uh, of all the great things in this state, actually, and I felt so proud watching him. And so it's a treat to be, uh, to be uh, amongst company like that. Well, we're welcome. So anyway, thank you. Certainly. Um, look, uh, of course, Rusty was chatting about technology and, and new things um, over in the Appalachians, and um, and we're we're none of those things. Uh, I was um, talking with a potential investor in Brown Foreman. Of course, we're a public company and have been listed since 1933. Mm -hmm. um, we limped through prohibition. Um, more on that later, and uh, uh, and have been public since 1933. And anyway, this potential investor, Jay, where's our investor related? I, I've, I've not followed up with him yet on this. In any event, uh, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, so, and she would say, well, tell me what's new at Brown Foreman. And I said, well, uh, honestly, I would hope to tell you that nothing is new at Brown Foreman. And um, we're just doing the same thing we've done for 147 years, uh, which is distill whiskey uh, in Kentucky. And so um, it's certainly not as you know, as exciting as some of the companies that we read about in the news, but um, but it's it's a wonderful industry in this state. It's a 2.6 percent of Kentucky GDP mm. is, uh, is is whiskey. Mm -hmm. uh, most of that would be bourbon. Uh, I've seen some brandy around as well these days. I'm not sure if that's in the 2.6 number. Um, I think we've, there's a payroll in the state of 800 million from the, the 17,500 uh, that are employed in our industry mm -hmm. make about 800 million. Uh, I think payroll taxes 825 or something. That doesn't seem to make sense. As I read that, I was like, well, hang on now. Uh, but anyway, maybe maybe all that will change. Uh, so it's um, uh, it, it certainly uh, has ha has an impact on the economy mm -hmm. of this state. The 2.6 number might be smaller than some people would think. Um, they think horses, bourbon, when they think Kentucky. Um, but uh, and so I do think that as an industry, we punch out of our weight class in terms of the cultural impact that we have in the state and, and for the state. Sure. Uh, and, I, and, um, and we can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, the, but it, times always haven't been this good. Correct. Um, when I, I was born in 1969, and between my birth date, actually, which was yesterday, uh, so I'm 48 yesterday. Well, happy birthday uh, oh, again. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and, uh, and, and the time that I joined the company in 1996, um, North American whiskey, so that would include Canadian, in this country, the United States, was at 70 million cases. By the time I joined, it was 35 million cases. Oh. Um, so it were, they were tough times for the generation before mine. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when a lot of the businesses in this city would have been sold in this state uh, to foreign companies, Canadian and, and British for the most part, sure. um, in the 1970s. Um, well, if I could take you back just a moment, because the 2.6 billion, it is, you know, the bourbon industry is signature yeah. um, in Kentucky, but recognizing that there are a number of non-Kentucky bourbon distillers popping up all over the country. Yeah. How serious do you think that threat is to our signature industry? Okay, now I'm about to get in trouble in two states, um, Kentucky and Tennessee. So uh, bear, bear with me. Um, it, that's complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, well, for starters, of course, some of those distilleries outside the state are, are, uh, are run and managed by people inside the state. Um, right. Paul Vargas over there, our CEO, um, and, and he, in his 30 years um, at Brown Foreman, has been um, one of the key individuals who has, in some ways, saved the industry in this state because of the work that he did and his team on Jack Daniels Tennessee whiskey. And outside of our country, and even sometimes outside the state, people confuse Jack with as a bourbon. 
And so um, in, in Europe, for instance, uh, the bourbon category includes Jack Daniels. Um, and so many Kentucky CEOs will tell us confidentially you know, how much Jack has helped them open doors uh, to the American whiskey palate abroad. So certainly outside the US, non-Kentucky whiskeys like Jack have helped open American whiskey doors uh, through which uh, Kentucky brands have walked. Okay. Um, and uh, I remember when I was in marketing on Jack Daniels in, in London, I just I, I, sh I met a very kind gentleman. His cards in my pocket from Jim Beam earlier today. But when Jim Beam would advertise, our sales in Jack Daniels would go up. Um, but it was this aberration we couldn't figure out. Had some statisticians, you know, dig into the numbers, and and I, I was like, but that's when Beam advertises. And so it just shows you the confusion that c consumers have. It means a lot to us, obviously, but um, less so to them. Now, w w I so. But more to the, your point of this sort of you know boom. Look, there are 30 new distilleries in Tennessee. You see them in out west, in the east. You know, Hudson River, even Brooklyn. Uh, I would offer two things. Number one is that look, the more that we see quality, premium, aged American spirits on the shelves in this country, the more enthusiasm there will be around spirits, around aged whiskey like the, those that we make. And, and I think that that um, helps all of us uh, uh, steal share of mind away from vodka. It was Smirnoff, by the way, that helped um, really take a shot at this industry in the 70s and 80s okay. and, and other brands. So I think that you know we need to be um, statesmanlike about it Certainly. and recognize that they're only adding great value to the experience of our consumers and to the reputation of our industry. Um, now that said, you know, after a, a drink or two, I might offer a, another couple of opinions too. Um, it, uh, yes, it gets my competitiveness uh, mm -hmm. up a little bit, um, and uh, and I'm and I'll be disappointed occasionally when mm -hmm. I see people misrepresenting um, the stories behind their brands um, or behind their distilling process or lack thereof. Uh, and so, uh, anyways, you can see I'm quickly getting into another <laughs> non-statesman like. Uh, uh, yeah, set of opinions on this. I appreciate um, that. But anyway, it's uh, I, I think in the long run we'll all I think any growth that we can get back to that seven million case, seventy million case mark is a wonderful thing. Okay. Well, and speaking of the enthusiasm for the bourbon industry, how long do you envision that this boom is going to continue? That's a good question. Um, the good news uh, is that um, this industry the, tends to go in twenty-five year life cycles. Mm -hmm. And that you know painful one from 1970 to 96 would be an example. Uh, the the current boom that we're all looking at really I'd say goes back sort of seven eight years. You know so on that by that measure we've got 20 years left. Um, but uh, but there's another set of facts. It's just that there's there are three billion cases. That's a 12 bottle case of uh, of spirits around the world. Mm -hmm. And the bourbon industry has a 1% share of it. Wow. So I'm thinking we've got a very healthy couple of centuries ahead of us. <laughs> I think you do. Yeah. <laughs> I think you yeah. do. Yeah. Share with me, if you will, aside from your summers in Kentucky at the family farm, um, you were pretty much raised outside of Kentucky, yes. even outside of the US. Yes. Um, so how does this shape your perspective on the bourbon industry in Kentucky, uh, both domestically as well as globally? Yeah. Well, it's, um, yeah, I, look, I always feel like I have to apologize for my accent um, when I'm in Kentucky or when I'm representing the company. And uh, so I apologize. Um, but yeah, for um, basically what happened in my situation is my, um, my father's from Louisville, Kentucky, uh, was, and uh, uh, and my mum uh, is Canadian from Montreal. They met on a cruise, got married, two kids, uh, divorced, all of them in five years. My mum gave it a go in Kentucky, um, but ended up moving back to Montreal. Okay. So I was raised there from the age of three to 22. Um, okay. Formative years, they tell me. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, uh, honestly, I learned how to, I was thinking about this the other day, I learned how to read and write in French before I did English. 
Um, I can assure you my English is much okay. better now than my French. Uh, but um, I used to dream in French as a kid. So yeah, I, and I think that um, that, that r r and yet, I, I'll, look, I'll tell you, uh, coming home to Louisville every summer was a wonderful thing. And, and I would be greeted by this wall of humidity and <laughs> you know, which we didn't have up north. Just, you know, it was summer here, and um, and relatives, and you know, my grandmother lived on a farm, which is now a suburban development called Sutherland, uh, in Prospect, Kentucky, and cows, and it was just make believe for me as a kid. Uh, I had a picture of my, a portrait of my grandfather, who died just before I was born uh, in Kentucky. Uh, hanging on my bedroom wall mm. in Montreal, and and I used to go to bed looking at this mysterious man. It was like a beacon to the south, and so I think that, in retrospect, that my odd upbringing um, ha has made me so much more appreciative, in a way, and respectful of the wonderful heritage and culture that I have been able to find in this state and and in and in our industry, and I. And I always um, enjoy um, almost being a third party endorser mm. of uh, the place that I have spent the most productive years of my life, which is Brown Foreman, and the state to which um, I have uh, directed the most emotional energy that I could ever hope for um, as, a, as a young man and an adult. And so, I, and I think that it gives me additional perspective on the state of Kentucky and, and on, our, on, on the bourbon industry because I see it through the eyes of a relative foreigner. Sure. And, um, and I, I don't take it for granted. And look, I'm walking through the hallways of, of London, England. Oh, you're an American. Yes, you know, I guess you're a banker from New York. No, I'm a, a distiller from Kentucky. And I, I, you, you can't imagine how the facial expression changes. And um, <laughs> <laughs> people, uh, it, Brown Foreman, has always done well when it's remembered where it's from. Mm -hmm. And any time that we've forgotten that, we've stumbled a bit. And um, But when we remind ourselves that we're from Kentucky and we're just distillers, we get the most wonderful welcome all over the world. And I hope that it helps, I'm looking now to the tourists, I hope that it helps this state, um, this, this home place. Certainly. Well, I'm glad that our weather could accommodate in providing you that humidity to make you feel welcome all over again. Thank you. So, but as we transition to more of some of the family business side, I think this would be a perfect segue to share with the audience the video that we have of who we are. Or okay, who you should are. I introduce it? Please. Is it ready to go, or do we need another 30? <laughs> <laughs> I keep going. So, um, I don't appreciate that, but oh. I'll keep going. <laughs> Okay, well, hang on. So this is um, so I'm fifth generation. There's about 40 of us in, mm. in my generation. Uh, my kids are I've got two, and I think we currently have maybe 65 kids in the sixth generation. Okay. So from our founder, um, so those would be the great 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 grandchildren of George Brown. And and look, they live all over the country, and some of them, you know, even you know out, outside the United States, and they've got different accents, passports. Religions, right? I, I mean, you know, got the Catholics, but you know, Catholic, <laughs> Protestant, Greek Orthodox, Jewish, you name it. And um, and so, uh, what we've done is taken some of our brand, you know, prowess, mm -hmm. and direct it towards the story of our company and the, and and the management team and the family, and the industry. And this, so what you're about to see is a video that we use for the sixth generation kids to try and hook them into the values of the company, the industry, and the, and the state of Kentucky, the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Six 
father started his one product from in the head of the forest. So he made a group of 100,000 cases. Now, 12. Jack Daniels is an American brand owned by an American company. It's one of the top 100 brands in the world in all categories. And that's a pretty incredible feat, not only for Ralph Foreman, but for Ralph Hamlin as well. The family brings in a continuity that you don't see in other companies. You say wood for now, it's like a mark of food. You know what you're talking about. You've got good taste. There was a disciplined approach to quality. You know, any restaurant or bar anywhere in the world, you go and you can see the results of your work. Right? And that's pretty fun. And yeah, you get to feel like you're going to stuff with this. <laughs> and I think what makes it unique about having a career here is that if you spend your entire working life here and experience just goodness and greatness around one, which I have, I've been pretty fortunate in that. And then you have that knowledge that will be around in 50 or 100 years. It means what you did that whole time is going to go on. We haven't lasted 143 years because of this change. We lasted this long because of our values, our culture, and our people. It's nice to be part of a brand that has that kind of power. In the end, we all really do care most about very sort of basic things. They become more valuable somehow to us. They mean more to us. Check manuals means much more than just whiskey. And I don't think the other brands in our industry can make the same claim. It's just this very simple thing. You know, it's beautiful spring water, grains, corn, malted barley, rye, which then put it into a sill, which is then run through a charcoal filter, which is then put it into a brand new white oak barrel. Hot summers and cold winters, many years later, put into a bottle and sold. And then we open the bottle and we pour a little into a glass and we sip on it. And somehow all that is led up to that moment when we are sipping that whiskey somehow means something to us. And we have an experience, we have this direct experience. We taste that whiskey and it's all those elements give it its flavor and its taste and its character and its spirit. Years for a bottle of old harvest to get to your table. It only works if other members of the family are going to understand what you have the same perspective. You've got to have the meeting that there are enough people that see it the same way you do. You don't want to be just another company in the world. Standing. Thank you. The video really highlighted a lot of the richness of the, the history of Brown Foreman and, and the family. And in your own words, could you share with us a brief history of this family business? Um, well, of course, we, start, we were founded in 1870 in Louisville, Kentucky by George Garden Brown, and, and he partnered originally with a brother. He was from Mumfordville, Kentucky, which I saw on that Eastern Kentucky map. Looks like it's now been moved into the Eastern Kentucky Territory. But in any event, it's on the way to Nashville, and uh, um, and we went through a variety of iterations, and, and there were just many companies like ours and started over here on Whiskey Row, where we're now building an old four-story distillery, which should open next spring. Um, and uh, the um, wonderful, actually, anyway, it's going to be great. I can't, I can't, I'm so excited. Um, so, uh, but we went public in 1933, and um, and we've always had, uh, and and as much as it is, we call it a family-controlled public company, um, because the family controls the voting shares um, and has slightly more than half the economic um, control as well. Uh, we've got a tradition of. Um, of being a very well-managed business. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're proud of. Um, and so to do that as a family business can sometimes take a f threading a few needles. Um, because maybe 
the best managers aren't to be found in the family you know shock surprise and and so we think we've gotten pretty good at that we think that we we thread that needle well and what I describe it as is sort of how do we get the family to enjoy engagement and balanced engagement is the key and that's about owning your shares I don't even like the word shareholder I prefer the word owner because it comes with more responsibilities I think and rather than than just rights and so to behave like an owner who's informed enough but not so much that you're nitpicking the label changes like I was doing at the table here on that old Forrester Mini which shouldn't have a brown back anyway that was not good engagement so you know we we would hope that that from the family we've got all the long-term values that help stabilize a business in an industry that has taken its knocks over the years sure and and actually we think that family values are really well suited to multi-year aged alcoholic beverages and heaven forbid even those from the state of Kentucky and and so we think that there's a lot of value to be had from family ownership and we know that we always want the best management team and we're so lucky over the years and the the different leaders that we've had you that was Bill Street's voice in that video at one point for anyone who would know Bill Street and and then Paul Varga's voice was in there as I said Paul just hit year 30 at Brown Foreman last week a graduate of St. X here in Louisville and in UK and and so we think that you know we're we've gotten good at finding the right balance as a family controlled public company okay well and if you could kind of expand upon some of those challenges in your role especially in managing and protecting the family's interest while not micromanaging you know the executive leadership that you have that's running the day-to-day well the of course the management team protect all shareholders interests and so we're we're so well aligned in that way thanks to being a public company in part which I really do and I'm actually as I say this I'm I wish I had studied the roster of guests more before speaking because I imagine there must be many of us here who are from family companies and but yeah being public or certainly at the very least I'm gonna get technical having shadow shares of some sort that the managers can own of course will aligns interests and then on our side the challenge is more how to hold on to this group of kids as they spread across the country and time zones and and all the rest of it and so we've done that by designing just you putting our marketing hats on and designing committees and groups that let people get involved in the business enjoy the culture take pride from the company in a very tangible way I think of it more like a tasting of course I could tell you what whiskey tastes like but if you taste it it's a much more memorable experience and and so we design experiential marketing really for our family and let them come along and enjoy the Brown Foreman brand and in different ways via philanthropy or or a sustainability foundation that we have called Denver fund committees and so on and so forth and of course also board membership six of us sit on the board of directors okay and I think there might be eight or nine of us who are working at the company okay and so before we transition over to more new as a person you you've talked about this generation of the family mm-hmm we're not out of time he's not giving me my book yet but you you've talked about this generation and there's 40 something of you and being pretty spread out some not in the states I'm out of the country so in recognizing that how in your words do you still think or say that Brown Foreman is a Kentucky company I'm an ex-marketing guy I always go to the P's to ask to answer tough questions you know product place people and and of course we we hope you agree that we make wonderful products that make you all proud of your home state we hope that that our products are synonymous with the values of Kentucky this Commonwealth that's been our home for a couple of hundred years as a family and 
and we make an effort on the people side uh, in our communities in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. we, we'd, we'd like to think of ourselves as a good corporate citizen. We can always do more, um, but we, we, we believe that we've been a, a, a steady and stable uh, member of this community. And, and in our company's leadership ranks, um, we've got a bias um, to homegrown talent, and, and, I, and I don't just mean from Louisville uh -huh. and from Kentucky, but also just from Brown Foreman. Um, and so we're quite keen on, um, on raising people up through the company over time and over years and decades, uh, wherever they're from. And we think that uh, in that way, um, you know, between our product and, and our sense of place in this city, and the fact that we've got homegrown talent, you know, that, that we continue to be a Kentucky company. And as I've said, I mean, I can't tell you enough, and I met with the chamber when they were in London a couple years ago, um, in terms of people growing their businesses outside of Kentucky. I just find that the Kentucky calling card is a wonderful one. And um, the United States, let me state the obvious, is a big place. And Actually, I don't even think Americans appreciate what an unbelievably wealthy, powerful, and wonderful country it is. Um, I do, because I've lived away from it for so long. And um, it's the little things you don't notice. You drive you know, through Kentucky and look at the fields. I mean, there, there's so many countries that would kill to have fields that they could leave um, you know, fallow for a season. And uh, it's just a rich, large place but it's also an intimidating country to people outside the United States and um, because it's so successful. And when you say you're from Kentucky, all the good comes through and all the intimidation and all some of that edge comes off and I, th I find it a wonderful door opener. Thank you. Um, earlier you gave us some some background information um, in terms of how you began to actually live abroad, I guess we would say. Could you share a little more um, on your background? Um, well, I, um, I, I, uh, growing up as a kid, um, I, and I'm uh, where the bath, I'm Catholic, my mom's Catholic, dad was Protestant. Um, yeah, I wanted to be a priest in Montreal. Uh, it's, it's not, those are the early okay. years. Um, I got in, I, so I sold whiskey instead. But uh, the, um, <laughs> Yeah. Some may like, argue it goes I was hand like, in they hand. can't have kids, Mom? I was like, I think I want to go work in the States. <laughs> so, uh, the, um, no, so I early on imagined that I would live in Montreal um, and if not a priest, become a lawyer. Uh, my Canadian family was full of lawyers and grandfather was a judge up in Quebec. And, um, but my, uh, my brother was always the more American of the two of us. He was a bit older when we moved to Canada. And he left Montreal when he was 15, really, went to boarding school and, and then University in the States. Um, Campbell Brown, who runs Old Forster, uh, the, the course, the, and is, you know, with the distillery getting built. Um, and so he joined Brown Foreman, and I was uh, living up in Canada doing a master's in political science, actually, okay. um, and thought I would, uh, you know, stay up there and um, become a professor or whatever. And, uh, but it looked, I was intrigued by what he was up to. He was working in the wine group in Chicago. Um, and uh, I ended up working at an NGO, a non-governmental organization, lobbying the UN in New York after I did my master's in poli-sci. Um, and thought I would check out our Brown Foreman's wine business. Uh, you know, I was sort of 26. So I just tried for a couple of years. Um, uh, and then uh, I just, I've been here ever since um, is what happened and I kind of got, you know, pulled into it. We had a wonderful uh, chairman and CEO, Alzie Brown II, mm -hmm. who was my first cousin once removed. Um, people are like, oh, your uncle Alzie, and go, oh, hang on, first cousin once removed. Uh, <laughs> and uh, double, no, not double. Anyway, that's someone else. Uh, so um, the, we had two brothers married two sisters, so their children were all double first cousins. Uh, mm. They'd go to the, your mom's house for Christmas to save people who saw at your dad's. You know, uh, <laughs> Anyway, so uh, if anyone knows Mac Brown, okay, he's, his dad and, and my grandfather were double first cousins. Uh, so um, anyway, like, <laughs> so how did I get into that? Uh, I can't remember. Oh, uh, Owsley. So I was working for Owsley. 
Um, and, uh, and he sort of took me under his wing nicely um, when I moved to Louisville with my Canadian wife from mm -hmm. Toronto. Um, and, and our kids, one child, my daughter was born here in Louisville uh, in 2003. And um, she's lovely. Walking through London with her English accent, you know, Daddy, that's my flag, you know, when she sees an American flag. Um, and she's actually, and she just bought online a vintage U of L sort of, you know, team jacket that mm. she's wearing around London. It's very sweet. Uh, she's 14. So, um, <laughs> um, then that's enough of those stories. So, the, uh, but, the um, anyway, so uh, through Owsley, he um, taught me a lot about uh, certainly on the corporate side, okay. and then I started working for Paul as well. Uh, after Bill Street retired, um, Paul became our beverage CEO, and so I was working for Paul and Owsley, which has certainly uh, been a wonderful foundation um, ever since. And I've been chairman of our board now for ten years. Okay. And and uh, and Paul's been our corporate CEO for I think maybe eleven years. And then he, but he, he's been running our beverage business, really, the company, let's say, since 2003. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank so you. So, a little fun fact. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> since we're, we're going down the fun lane, okay. you have been quoted as saying oh. that everyone should own a mint julep cup. Everyone should. So you want to share the significance? Well, honestly, and I'll tell you what, I was down at Woodford and I, I picked I picked one up for you. You picked one up? I did. Because I thought, I'm not leaving without giving you oh, well, a thank cup. you. You're very welcome. Now, it's it's not, the, and I didn't get it engraved, unfortunately. I was gonna, that was my I next question. I'm sorry, but I got you, anyway, a little something. Hang on. Here we go. Just, oh. you know, to keep, keep you happy this well, weekend. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yes, and I will use my old Forester in my Woodford Reserve with Julep Cup. <laughs> thank you. Well, on, I mean, here you, I just think that mint julep cups um, are, uh, and in, in my family, when people are, babies are born, their you know, parents or relatives will give them a mint julep cup with their initials engraved on it. And each time at different points in life that are significant, a graduation, a marriage, whatever it might be, you'll get a mint julep cup. Mm. And from a godparent, a grandparent, or whomever. And hopefully, by the time you're in your 20s, you've got enough to host a decent derby party, <laughs> and, and all your guests can enjoy their bourbon in a mint julep cup. Okay. And, um, and it's just so Kentucky. And uh, I used to, as a kid, it was in my bathroom in Montreal, and I'd keep my toothbrush in it. And my <laughs> mom would reprimand me, dear, you're ruining the silver finish. Yes. Um, but it was another one of those beacons that told me there were you know, good times ahead down okay. south. Well, thank you. It has truly been a pleasure, and I uh, I can't thank you enough for my gift. You are so welcome. I will welcome. definitely remember that. I guess before I wrap up, I need to ask the most important question. Uh-oh. How do you prefer your bourbon? Neat or on the rocks? Oh, 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 on the rocks. On the rocks. Yes, please. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much.